طلع البدر علينا من ثنيات اليد وجب الشكر علينا ما دعا لله دا أيها المسلمون في The Prophet tells them that Inna Ma'amura, this camel has already been given some instructions. It's going to stop where it has been instructed. The Prophet is going to migrate here, and from here his religion is going to spread. We came here in anticipation of that Prophet. And this city has been these Ansar. These were all descendants of those same 400 scholars that migrated many, 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 many generations ago to come to Medina in anticipation of those people who migrated to Medina way before the Prophet was even born. Their intention was that we want, we want to be those who greet this, this great Prophet. And if it's not us, it should be our progeny. We thought we would start a series on the seerah of Rasulullah for at least a couple of days from our four weekly halakas. So what we're going to try to do is probably the last two Saturdays we'll try to take a topic of seerah and discuss it. At this point, we're not going to go in an organized or chronological order. We're just going to pick up various events, aspects, and important highlights of the seerah of our blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Talk about it. We all know about how our Prophet ﷺ migrated from Mecca to Medina. And there were many elements behind that migration. Some of them were that the Muslims were under a constant state of oppression. They were not allowed to follow their deen, implement it. They were not allowed to announce the fact that they were a Muslim. Anyone who did so would be harmed oppressed, and they would be denied basic rights. There was a period when there was a boycott against the Muslims. For three years they lived in this condition. Now, the Prophet ﷺ is given the command by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to migrate. And he takes Abu Bakr and migrates. And perhaps on one of the days we'll talk about the actual journey of Hijrah. But we start our talk from the time that he has already entered into Quba, which is a small town about three miles before Medina. The Prophet ﷺ stays there, he has relatives, and he stays at the home of someone by the name of Kulthum ibn Hadam. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu stays at someone else's home. The Prophet ﷺ lays the foundation of Masjid Quba. Some historians say that he stayed there only four days. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. And he left Friday. Some say he stayed a little bit before that. A little bit more than that. So he arrived earlier and he stayed longer. But everyone agrees that he left on a Friday morning. And at a short distance from Quba towards Medina, the Prophet ﷺ stops. It's time for Jum'ah. And he leads the first Jum'ah prayer. And this is, as I said, a short distance from Masjid Quba going towards Medina Munawwara. Today, all of that 
region, including Quba, is included in Medina. Medina has expanded a great deal. And at that spot today, there is a masjid called Masjid al Jum'ah. So that's the first place that the Prophet ﷺ led Salat al Jum'ah in Medina. He gave a lengthy khutbah. And the amazing thing about that khutbah is that he ﷺ didn't tell them that, look, we have been forced to leave our home and now we're going to do something to take revenge or now we're going to regroup and do this and that. There was no such talk. There was just talk about self-improvement, about beliefs, about behaviors, about reconciling differences. And the Prophet ﷺ then started his walk or his journey, his short journey towards Medina. Now he is on his camel, Abu Bakr anhu is behind him on his, on his camel, and I use the word walk because the camel is moving very, very slowly. It's just walking. And on both sides are people of Medina. The men are there with their arms, with their swords, just as a show of respect, honor, and to show their support. And as the Prophet ﷺ goes through the different neighborhoods, the people of those neighborhoods approach him. And the way the city was organized at that time was that each tribe had its own neighborhood. So you lived in an area because your tribe lived there. And the neighborhoods were named after those tribes. So as he moved through the streets, <coughs> and the pathways on his way, the chief of each tribe, along with a few other people, would come and grab the rein of the camel of the Prophet ﷺ and earnestly request him to stay with them. And some narrations mention that each leader would, would talk about the advantages of living with them. O Prophet of Allah, we are the largest in number. O Prophet of Allah, we have the most livestock. Prophet of Allah, we are the strongest people. Everyone is trying to tell him the advantages and give him some incentive to come and settle down with them. Everyone wants this honor. The Prophet ﷺ tells them that Inna this camel has already been given some instructions. It's going to stop where it has been instructed. So he's, he makes dua for them. May Allah bless you. May Allah reward you. May Allah give you barakah. And he says, but please let go of the camel. It's going to go where it has been told. He himself is not controlling the camel. It's just walking. So here are all these people coming with these requests. At one point, the Prophet ﷺ passed by a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul who was a hypocrite. Now this man was setting himself up to be the leader, the ruler of Medina before the Prophet ﷺ migrated there. And all the tribes had more or less come to an agreement that we are going to make him our chief, the head of all the chiefs. And he was ready for that. But when the Prophet ﷺ reached there, he knew that those hopes were very short-lived. He could not expect to now be the leader of Medina while the Prophet ﷺ has arrived. So he disliked the Prophet ﷺ from his heart because even though the Prophet ﷺ had not come in as a ruler or a king, he had just migrated there. The people obviously unanimously accepted him as the elder and as, as the leader. Abdullah ibn Ubay at that time knew that he had to make a decision. Because all of Medina had accepted Islam, he knew that if he did not show that he was also a Muslim, he would be sidelined. And whatever little bit of influence he had over the people, he'd lose that as well. So he showed that he had also accepted Islam, even though he hadn't. And he betrayed the, the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims on many occasions. So the Prophet ﷺ 
who is aware of this man, this man's intentions, his goals, ambitions, just to test him, he says, Oh, Abdullah, why don't we stop by you? He knows the camel is going to go where it has been commanded, but just to check the response of this person. And while all the other tribes are vying with one another, competing with one another to have the Prophet ﷺ stay with them, this man says, no, you should stay with those people who have invited you here and those who have brought you here. So his nifaq, his hypocrisy became obvious from, from day one. The camel keeps going and the people keep coming and approaching. Eventually, the Prophet ﷺ reaches Medina proper. And in Medina proper, he reaches an area that was inhabited by a tribe called Banu Malik ibn Najjar. Now, from some ahadith, like the hadith of Muslim, we find that the Prophet ﷺ himself preferred to settle with these people, to stay with them, because they happen to be his distant relatives. Because Malik ibn Najjar was an uncle, a maternal uncle of Abdul Muttalib. So from that aspect, they were distant relatives. But he, alayhi salatu wasalam, didn't do anything to the camel. It just made its way there. And it stopped in an open area that was used for drying, drying fruit. It was just like a small field. The camel stops there. The Prophet didn't get, doesn't get off. He stays on the camel. And the camel gets up again. It gets up and it walks a short distance and sits down. The Prophet still doesn't get off. Then the camel gets up, comes back to its first spot and sits down again. This is how it happens. So it sits, then moves a little bit, sits down again, and comes back to its first place where it sat down. The Prophet asks, whose property is this? He said, oh, it belongs to two, two orphans, Sahal and Suhail. Before we go on with this story, I want to just pause here for a second. Pause right here, and let's go back a few hundred years. This is well before the Prophet ﷺ. There used to be a chain of, of rulers and kings who were called Tababi'a and Tubba' was the title given to a special, a certain line of kings and rulers from Yemen. Just like the rulers of, of Egypt were known as pharaohs, Fara'ina. And the rulers of Habasha were known as Najashi. Similarly, the rulers of that region of Yemen were called Tababi'a. Singular is Tubba. One of those rulers of Yemen desired to expand his kingdom. So he moved from Yemen outwards, north, and outwards towards Hijaz. And he conquered many areas of Hijaz. And he eventually made his way to Medina Munawwara. This was called Yathrib. And he takes over Yathrib. And he appoints his son as his governor over Yathrib. He's the ruler on behalf of the king over Yathrib. And he moves on to conquer other areas. Now, the people of Yathrib succumbed quickly to this Tubba, to this king. And the king had no trouble in fixing his son, taking oaths of allegiance, promises of submission and obedience from the people. And once he felt things had settled down, he moved on. But soon after he moved on, the people of Medina, of Yathrib, revolted against him. And they killed that prince. When the king found out, he comes back to Yathrib in a rage. 
and he starts killing. And he vows to kill and kill and kill until there is nothing left of this city. He is in a, he's in a fit. He's in a rage. So there he goes, killing people. While he's going through this, some Jewish scholars came to him. And they said, look, we have something we want to share with you. We have come to this city because we have learned that the last and final prophet is going to come here. And this has been told to us in our scriptures. And this city has been called Tayba. The final prophet is going to migrate here. And from here his religion is going to spread. We came here in anticipation of that prophet. And this city has been mentioned in the divine scriptures. So we request you that out of respect, out of honor for this city which has been mentioned and been given so much importance, and out of respect for the prophet that is going to be sent here, we request you to please think about what you're doing and stop. Tumba went through those scriptures. He went through the description of the city and the virtues of this prophet that is about to be sent. And so he stopped. He says, for this sake, I shall stop. And he left Medina and he moved on and went back to Yemen. And some of these Jewish scholars, some of these rabbis, they accompanied him. And from time to time, they would tell him about this prophet. And they would tell him about what's going to happen with that religion and what's going to happen with those people and all of these things. So he became very much taken by this prophet. He started thinking about him. He started talking about him. He started reciting couplets about him. And those couplets are preserved even till today. At one point, there was a group of 400 scholars that he had living with him. These are people that are, he turns to uh, for advice, for knowledge. They requested leave from him. And they said, we also want to go and live in that city. We don't want to part with you, but now the love for this prophet that is coming has, has overwhelmed us, and we want to be a part of all of that. If not us, then our progenies, our children. So he agreed to let them go. And in fact, he gave them all money. He got them all married. In some narrations, it's mentioned that he got them all married on his own expense. In other narrations, it's mentioned that he gave them all maids. He had a house built for every single one of them. And he had one house built for this prophet that is going to come on his own expense. And he wrote a letter with his special seal and gave it to the leader of all of those scholars. And he said that you are to go and construct a house on my behalf for this prophet. This house shall be dedicated for him. You will live there. Your progenies will live there. And when this prophet comes, you will be his host. So this group of 400 people moves to Medina. They start living there. And the generations begin to pass. That generation is finished. Another generation begins, then another, then another. And like this, after many, many generations, the Prophet ﷺ finally migrates to Medina. 
So this is what everyone was waiting for and everyone knew about. Now we talked about the camel. Let's come back to our story. The camel stops. The Prophet ﷺ remains seated on it. It gets up and it goes and sits down again. The first spot that it sat down at was the site where the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ was constructed. The second spot that it sat down at was the house of someone who lived there. And his name was Abu Ayyub. And Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu was the one who had the honor of hosting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And guess what? His house was that very same house that was constructed by that Dubba and dedicated for this Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abu Ayyub Ansari radiallahu anhu was the direct descendant of that scholar that Tubba gave this instruction to and gave him that letter with the seal that give this to that Prophet when he comes. And this was something that was kept as a legacy in that household until the Prophet ﷺ himself arrived. Which is why some ulama of Sirah, some historians have said that the camel did not stop in front of anyone's house other than the house of the Prophet ﷺ himself. That house had been built for him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided that camel to stop precisely and exactly there where it needed to. We hear about the Ansar, the helpers. These were the people of Medina who accepted Islam in the life of the Prophet ﷺ and then became the supporters of the Prophet ﷺ and his deen. Who were these Ansar? These were all descendants of those same 400 scholars that migrated many, 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 many generations ago to come to Medina in anticipation of this Prophet ﷺ. These were the Ansar. And Abu Ayyub Ansari anhu was the direct descendant of the one who was to live in that house and guard that house and keep it till the Prophet ﷺ himself came. And some historians mentioned that after the Prophet ﷺ started living there, Abu Ayyub Ansari radiallahu anhu presented the Prophet ﷺ with that letter with its original seal. We were fortunate enough to visit the grave of Abu Ayyub Ansari radiallahu anhu, which is at Istanbul in Turkey. And he radiallahu anhu, had gone in an expedition in that direction to the land that is known as Turkey today. And he passed away, he got sick along the way. And before he died, he told his companions that I want you to take me as far as you travel to the furthest point of your journey. I want you to take me there even after I die and bury me at that spot. And when Istanbul was being conquered by the Muslims, many, many centuries later, just before the Muslims came into Istanbul, they discovered the grave of Abu Ayyub Ansari anhu. By the wall of Istanbul, the Muslims at that time, the Sahaba and Tabi'een at that time, did not manage to get into the city. But that was the furthest point that they had traveled and they buried Abu Ayyub and Sayyidina were right at the wall of the city. And he's buried there. And that whole area, in fact, is called Ayyub. And the Turks also call it Sultan Ayyub. And the masjid is called the Masjid of Sultan Ayyub. So look at how far intentions go. This king planned not for his for himself or for his sons or his grandsons. He planned for so many generations ahead. And by doing so, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the honor of actually hosting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and making arrangements for him. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lived in that house for a good amount of time, they say at least six months. So, how far ahead are you and I thinking? And how far ahead are you and I planning? Sometimes we have difficulty planning till the end of our day. Sometimes we don't even plan for the next day or the next week. But look at how these people planned. When you plan ahead for the sake of deen, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also assists you and helps you. Those people who migrated to Medina way before the Prophet ﷺ was even born. Their intention was that we want, we want to be those who greet this, this great Prophet. And if it's not us, should be our progeny, should be our children. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave that to them, gave that honor to them. So you and I also need to broaden and expand our intentions. A Muslim is someone with great vision, someone with great depth, someone with great thinking powers. That's why the Qur'an reminds us, tells us, encourages us to contemplate, to think, to plan, to ponder, to reflect. Today, the plans of people have become limited to just their worldly needs. We are just planning those things that will help us take care of our worldly needs for some amount of time. We plan our education. We plan our careers. This is all good. There's nothing wrong with it. We're not telling people to stop planning their education or to stop planning their careers or to stop planning their finances or to stop planning their worldly goals. We're not saying that. All we are saying is that start planning for deen. Just like you're planning for dunya, plan for your deen. Just like people think of what's going to happen to their progeny in worldly terms after they leave this world. It's important for a Muslim to think about what's going to happen to their progeny in religious terms as well. People think about what legacy they're going to leave behind for their children in terms of property, in terms of estate. But it's also important for us to think about what legacy we're going to leave for the next generation in terms of deen, in terms of iman, in terms of tools and resources so that they can flourish and prosper as believers no matter what day and era and age they're living in. The time to do that planning is now while you're still young. Plan your life as a Muslim. Set goals for yourself. Where do you want to be in Iman, in Taqwa, in Ilm, 10 years from now? What are you doing about it? When you get to high school, they start giving you courses on career planning. They want you to have an organized approach to your career. They want you to be careful and wise about the selections you make. You choose courses based on that. You make plans based on that. And then you start the process. The day-to-day -day work. Day-to-day -day homework, assignments, weekly or bi-weekly or monthly, quizzes, tests, things you have to submit. Someone is always on your case, <coughs> monitoring your progress. If you start slipping, notices are sent. So, the goal is to become such and such. Whether it's a doctor, it's an engineer, it's an accountant, it's a tradesman, it's a business, whatever it is. But, Everything is done in steps. The planning is far and the steps are gradual and consistent. The same thing applies to deen. Who do you want to be five years from now as a Muslim? Because there are thousands of levels. Hum darajatun Allah. Everyone is not the same in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. People hold different statuses in the sight of Allah. 
What status do I hold today? What status do I want to hold five years from now? Two years from now? One year from now? Six months from now? What daily homework do I need to do to get there? What's the follow-up? What are the assignments? What are the tests? How do I prepare for them? That's really what this is all about. And if we start doing that, if we can plan a few years ahead, or some time ahead for ourselves, we get in the habit of it, believe me, we will be the ones who are planning for the next generations. But if you can't plan for yourself, you can't plan for the next generation. It's easy to talk big. It's easy to say we want to create this and make this and make that. But if we can't get ourselves in order, and this is one of the things that I, that I really felt, I could feel, I could see in this last trip that I, that I made, that we all need to start paying more attention to making ourselves better people. There's no doubt in my mind. We tend to become too content with who we are and what we are. So look, those people planned, Allah gave them this honor, we're talking about it today. If we plan and we act, inshaAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will also not only preserve deen in us, in our progenies, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use us all as tools, as instruments for the spreading of deen in the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the understanding and the ability to take lessons from the seerah of his blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa akhu da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in.